One of the most influential bands in rock history, Linkin Park would go from undesirable to undeniable, as they faced countless rejections from record labels only to become one of the most prolific artists of the new millennium. Yet the band's path to legend status was marred by struggles with addiction, numerous stints in rehab, and tragically culminated in the untimely passing of lead singer Chester Bennington. So how did Linkin Park go from dominating rock radio to being booed and pelted with trash on stage. To truly understand the band's tragic history, we first need to go back to 1991, where future Linkin Park founder Mike Shinoda was about to attend the concert that changed his life forever. Born and raised in Southern California, Shinoda was enrolled in classical piano lessons at the age of six. Nevertheless, he would discover hip-hop music as a teenager, developing an obsession with rappers such as Run DMC LL Cool J, and the Beastie Boys. The teen was especially fascinated with the songs that were unafraid to merge the contrasting sounds of rock and rap together. I heard Led Zeppelin because Beastie Boys sampled them. Those things were just, those guys were paving the way for what was teaching me about blending genres. At the age of 14, Shinoda would secure tickets to Anthrax and Public Enemy's 1991 co-headlining tour. Accompanied by his friend Mark Wakefield and chaperoned by Mark's father, Shinoda looks back on the show as a pivotal moment in his life, as he was able to witness firsthand the power that lied within the mixing of musical genres. Shinoda and Wakefield were so inspired by the concert that they decided to form a band and begin making music together, though the two didn't know know it at the time, this moment marked the inception of what would later evolve into Linkin Park. When we were probably like 19, it was the two of us making little demos. I had like a drum machine and a sampler. He had a guitar and a little amp that was this big and yeah. no bass. We rented a bass or we just played it on keyboard. No drums. I just programmed those. The duo soon began jamming with Wakefield's next door neighbor, Brad Delson, who subsequently brought drummer Rob Borden into the group. After high school, Shinoda enrolled at Pasadena, California's Art Center College of Design, where he crossed paths with a budding illustrator and DJ named Joseph Hahn. United by their passion for hip hop, Hahn was quickly invited to the band. Meanwhile, just a stone's throw away at the University of California, Los Angeles, Rob Borden Borden connected with bassist Dave Farrell, whose addition to the group finally solidified their lineup. Dubbing themselves Zero, the first iteration of Linkin Park was now complete. Shinoda soon transformed his bedroom into a makeshift studio, equipped with a four-track recorder and microphone to craft the band's early demos. Zero's members would spend their evenings playing music, with Shinoda recalling the chaos of juggling school life while being in a band in an interview with Rolling Stone. I'd do classes from 9 to 4, 4 to 7, and 7 to 10 at night. I'd go from there to band practice in Hollywood for two or three hours, then all the way back to my parents' house and work on paintings until I couldn't do it anymore. Then I'd get up in the morning and do it all again. Despite limited resources, the band managed to release a self-titled four-track demo in November of 1997 and made their live debut at the Whiskey A Go Go in West Hollywood, opening for System of a Down. Seeking guidance on securing a record deal, Brad Delson approached Jeff Blue, his former boss and vice president of A&R at Zomba Music, whom he had interned for during college. Impressed by Zero's music, Blue provided constructive criticism to help the band attract record labels. Among his advice was his belief that the band needed to replace their vocalist. Over the next year, the band faced a relentless wave of rejection as they struggled to catch the eye of numerous record labels. This led to mounting frustrations within the group that culminated in the unceremonious dismissal of their singer, Mark Wakefield. We showcased for every major and every independent label um, and they effectively passed. And then we parted ways with Mark. He was having a hard time being a singer. Uh, he was much, he loved music. He was good at writing. He was much better at 
managing, it turned mm -hmm. out. Meanwhile, in Arizona, the band Grey Days was facing a struggle of their own. Despite having released two full-length albums, headlining local venues, and receiving radio play, the band's lack of motivation and direction confined their success to the local scene. None were more frustrated by the group's complacency than their singer Chester Bennington, who would recall, Nobody outside Arizona was interested in Grey Days. It was very difficult to be the guy who wrote and sang the songs and share the credit with people who didn't really give a sh**. I was pretty frustrated. Bennington, already a father, felt the need to get his act together. He would ultimately decide to leave the band and transition into the corporate world as an assistant at a digital services firm. But just as he settled into the 9-to-5 grind, Bennington received a call of Zomba Music's Jeff Blue, who offered him the audition of a lifetime. Yeah, I remember um, getting a call from a friend of mine who used to represent an old band of mine saying that, you know, um, there was this great young group of guys that had this really great sound and all they were looking, all they needed was that, was that voice that was going to help them complete the puzzle. Bennington then received an instrumental version of one of Zero's songs, telling Kerrang! magazine, Mike's rapping was really good, and I felt I could improve on the melodies as far as their choruses were concerned. Something told me that this was the golden ticket to get inside Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. Inspired by the track, he swiftly added his vocals, creating a demo that he rushed delivered to Zomba Music. Jeff Blue, upon hearing Bennington's audition, tape was amazed by the raw emotion in his singing, stating, What I heard floored me. Every crack of his voice had a story to tell. It was genuine, vulnerable, urgent, beautiful, and hit you in the gut. Soon, Bennington flew to Zero's rehearsal space in Los Angeles, with his future hinging on this audition. Despite initial doubts due to his reserved appearance, once Chester started singing, it was clear he was destined to become Zero's lead singer. When Chester did his audition, there was another guy, because we had a little practice room in, in Hollywood, and the guy basically heard Chester sing and just said, I don't need, even need to audition. If you guys don't go with this guy, you're crazy. The band subsequently welcomed the talented singer into their group. Nevertheless, Chester Bennington's raw talent was shadowed by a deep darkness. Raised in Phoenix, Arizona, he was the youngest of four siblings to a nurse mother and a police detective father. At just 11, his parents split it, leading him to live with his father, who was often absent due to his intense work investigating child SA. Bennington would later recount his father's struggle with mental health during this time. Tragically, within the next two years, Bennington faced SA at the hands of an older male friend, telling Rolling Stone, I was getting beaten up and being forced to do things I didn't want to do. It destroyed my self-confidence. Prior to channeling his emotions into music, the frontman, in an attempt to cope with the trauma he endured, resorted to hard drugs and alcohol at a shockingly young age. I started using drugs when I was 11. I think that uh, given the nature of a lot of the aspects of my childhood, the, when that first person offered me, you know, an escape from reality, um, I kind of took it and I ran with it. Shortly after Bennington joined the band Zero, they rebranded as Hybrid Theory. However, their excitement was short-lived as they discovered another band had already taken the name. Even still, Shinoda looks back on this as a blessing, telling Kerrang, I'm kind of glad we don't call ourselves by that name anymore. Hybrid music is such a trend right now. It's almost a joke to say that your band is about mixing styles, since everybody is doing it. The band would then brainstorm several new name ideas until Bennington proposed Lincoln Park, drawing inspiration from the park in Santa Monica. It's a place in Santa Monica in Los Angeles. It's named after the American president, Abraham Lincoln. We spelled it differently so that we could get the web domain name for a far cheaper price. Actually, ironically, like the cool thing is, is like when we when we show up, like when we toured the States, 
Mm -hmm. um, everywhere we went, we were like locals. Like yeah. all the kids would come up and be like, hey, dude, we live in Lincoln Park too, man. Where you, where, which street did you grow up on? <laughs> Although Bennington had fully committed to the band, he still harbored lingering doubts about whether he had made the right decision. Revealing to the LA Times, I was just thinking about how great my life in Phoenix was in comparison to what I was doing out here. Even though I didn't have a lot of money, at least I had a job and a decent place to live, and I didn't have all my stuff in my car. In the early days of Linkin Park, the singer faced hardships, enduring periods of homelessness as he navigated between friends' couches and living in his car. The band soon began leveraging the growing power of the internet to reach out to potential fans on music boards and chat rooms cultivating a dedicated following. This grassroots approach led to a fan base that actively promoted the band's music, propelling them into the spotlight. We do all of our communication with our fan base through our website and through our email. Um, we actually have a street team that we run of, of about a thousand kids across the country that just are diehard Linkin Park supporters. During this period, the band produced a nine-song demo, which they shared with various record labels. Unfortunately, despite their efforts, over 45 labels declined to sign them on, casting shadows on their musical journey. In an interview with Metal Hammer, Bennington would look back on his band's struggle to secure a record deal. I think we confused people. Nobody really knew what to do with us. They were thinking, how do we promote this? Where does this go at radio? I could see how they thought it was just too much work. It was a pain in the ass but it gave us time to figure out who we were as a band, and gave Mike and I time to get comfortable with one another. In a final, desperate bid for a record deal, the band turned to their longtime supporter, Jeff Blue, who had now transitioned to Warner Brothers Music. It was at this juncture that he chose to sign Linkin Park in 1999, despite Warner Brothers having rejected the band three times before. Yet, the road ahead was not paved with success for the band, even after securing the deal with WB. The journey through the making of their debut album, Hybrid Theory, was fraught with challenges and hardships, with Bennington recalling, I had to work at coffee shops part-time, just to have money to go eat at Sandy's Burger across the street from where we we practiced. I went insane. Sometimes at midnight, I'd be knocking at Mike's door, telling him, I can't do this. The band soon clashed with their label on musical direction and the band's roster. Initially, label executives attempted to remove Shinoda from the band using a divide and conquer technique, insisting that Bennington should be the face of the band. The guy that had brought us in literally at one point was like, trying to kick me out of the group. He was trying to get the group to sound different. He was trying to write stuff on the album, which Jesus. Did, did not happen. They didn't want you rapping, right? Yeah, at one point he suggested... Sorry. Dude, he, the, my favorite suggestion ever was he he had met some like reggae, reggae dude from New York that he had suggested replace me. What? On In The End. Bennington's unwavering loyalty to his bandmates stood strong, but a new hurdle soon emerged. The band would struggle to find a producer willing to work on their album, as many shied away from newly signed acts. However, their luck soon improved as producer Don Gilmore, known for his work with Lit and Eve 6, took the helm. Reusing many songs from their demos that were once turned down by record labels, the band meticulously refined their tracks at the famed NRG Studios. But tensions began to simmer between the band and Gilmore, as Bennington revealed to Metal Hammer, I just wanted to punch that dude in the face. I was so pissed. Nothing I did was good enough for him. I thought, Man, everything you say to me takes me one step closer to the edge, and I'm about to break. And then I thought, wait, that might actually work. Linkin Park, unlike many bands, maintained a punk rock DIY attitude even after signing with a major label. With Han and Shinoda handling artwork, and Borden and Delson managing finances and marketing, the band members were very much hands-on. Bennington even oversaw merchandise design, while Farrell meticulously maintained the tour diary on the group's website. 
Their album Hybrid Theory, released on October 24, 2000, fused pop, hip-hop, metal, and electronica, unknowingly setting a new standard for the decade. Warner Brothers unveiled their lead single, One Step Closer, at a radio convention, leaving programmers in awe of the distinctive vocal chemistry between Bennington and Shinoda, which would become a hallmark of the band's sound. The single quickly soared to the number 4 position on the mainstream rock charts, with its video dominating MTV. In March 2001, Crawling was released as the second single, peaking at number 3 on the mainstream rock charts. The album's fourth single, In The End, was released a full year after Hybrid Theory and emerged as the band's most successful single from the album. This track, distinguished by its iconic piano introduction, maintained a remarkable 39-week presence on the charts, reaching its peak at number 2 on the Hot 100 charts. Yet, had it been Bennington's call, that song wouldn't have made it onto the album. As he told V Club, I was never a fan of In The End, and I didn't even want it to be on the record, honestly. How wrong could I have possibly been? I basically decided at that point, I don't know what I'm talking about. The album debuted at the 16th spot on the Billboard charts, selling approximately 50,000 copies within its debut week. Remarkably, even 18 months post-release, the album sustained sales of 100,000 copies per week in the U.S. Hybrid Theory eventually soared to a remarkable 32 million copies sold globally, securing its position as the top-selling album of the year 2000 and one of the decade's best sellers. Notably, media coverage highlighted that the band's inaugural record steered clear of profanity, a surprising feature given its heavy guitars and intense lyrics. And we also uh, un unconsciously uh, didn't use any vulgarity on our record. And I think that those are things that kind of um, really step out, especially lyrically, because um, kids can uh, appreciate, they, they seem to appreciate our honesty in our lyrics rather than um, just kind of coming up with something to try to sound tough or mm, sound like you yeah. know what you're talking about, so. The band, despite its massive fan base, faced detractors, becoming a polarizing group. Some in the metal scene dismissed them as a boy band with guitars, yet this criticism failed to deter its resilient members. Moreover, in addition to that, the band faced accusations of being corporate puppets, with Shinoda remembering, We did get a reputation for being a business rather than a band, but that was because we were so focused on getting our stuff done. It wasn't in the name of business. It was in the name of building up this thing we had worked so hard to create. We were prepared to do everything in our power to be successful on all levels. In 2001, the band performed an impressive 324 shows. Media often portrayed them as straight edge, emphasizing their strong work ethic. They enforced strict rules on their tour buses and dressing rooms. No partying, alcohol, smoking, or drugs. Shinoda, critical of rock and roll cliches, found parties mundane and preferred writing music with friends. Bennington, on the other hand, had a past marked by substance abuse, with these inner demons resurfacing during the Hybrid Theory tour. During this period, the singer consistently performed under the influence, indulging in substances until just before going on stage. Following their shows, Papa Roach would take Bennington out for heavy drinking, much to the disapproval of his bandmates. This strain even led to Bennington traveling separately from the band for a time. As the band shifted focus to their next project, the members of Lincoln Park now faced the daunting task of somehow surpassing the success of Hybrid Theory. The goals then were, okay, that first record, I mean, we could never have imagined the success of Hybrid Theory. It was the number one record on the planet. It, you couldn't have gotten any bigger. So now the pressure is to prove that we, that we could do it again because it was our music. There was like rumors that it wasn't us making it. So we had to dispel that nonsense. And um also do some of the things on the second record that we now had room 
to further the conversation and do. In between hybrid theory and the group's subsequent full-length album, Linkin Park's release of the remix record Reanimation in 2002 marked another triumph, ranking as the fourth highest-selling remix album in history. Linkin Park then began writing their sophomore album while on tour with the traveling festival OzFest. The band even toured with two buses. One was equipped with a studio for recording ideas on the road, while the other served as the living and sleeping quarters for the band members during breaks between gigs. Following the tour, the band returned to NRG Studios with producer Don Gilmore, who expressed doubts about surpassing their first album's success. Despite this, the triumph of hybrid theory granted Linkin Park some much-needed artistic freedom for their next record. However, the year that followed revealed a decline in new Metal's popularity. Limp Bizkit's results may vary and Korn's Take a Look in the Mirror both fell short of sales projections, hinting at the genre's fading era. Chester shared his perspective on the evolving music scene in a 2003 interview with Kerrang, stating, There is an up and down cycle in everyone's life and career. If our fans don't like our album, I think we should take it as a sign that we've lost touch with our fans and we need to regain that trust. This band works better under pressure. We're not going to worry about outselling hybrid theory, because you cannot count on those things. You just have to go in and write songs you like and do things that make you happy. If you can do that, then you've succeeded. By August of 2002, Linkin Park had composed over 80 songs, but only 13 made the cut for their second studio album, Meteora, which hit shelves on March 25th, 2003. Linkin Park's label handpicked the initial singles from their album. The track Somewhere I Belong was strategically chosen as the lead single to satisfy fans that were seeking a sound reminiscent of hybrid theory. But the band insisted on eventually releasing Breaking the Habit as a single as well. Unlike their previous works, Breaking the Habit ditched the rap vocals and heavy guitar riffs, paving the way for their future sound. Although some critics thought Linkin Park played it safe, Meteora still debuted at number one on the Billboard 200, selling nearly a million copies in the first week. The album has since sold over 16 million copies globally, ranking as the eighth best-selling album of the 21st century. However, it's the closing track, Numb, that has left the most lasting impact. With over 2.1 million views on YouTube, Numb holds the title of the most viewed rock music music video on the platform. Despite its success, the album only received one Grammy nomination for the instrumental track Session, much to the chagrin of Chester Bennington, who would state, I personally feel that this record is better than Hybrid Theory. I think there are certain songs that definitely exceed the quality of even Crawling, and to not even be nominated for a track that was an album track. I mean, it was an instrumental, like an interlude. Personally, I'm kind of insulted. I think I'd rather be not nominated for anything than to be nominated for a track that's not even a band track. Linkin Park would then return in 2004 through a collaborative album with rapper Jay-Z, a project initiated by MTV. The funny thing is, as it went, like they, what MTV's thing was, um, hey, you guys go up and jam and like maybe do one mashup. Okay. And we came with like a half an album worth of mashups. Yeah. And I was, because my thing was this, what they didn't know is that I learned how to produce by doing mashups. I had been doing mashups for easily five years, six years before they even asked us to do this thing. So they were asking somebody who's like, that's, yeah. that's what I do. Yeah, yeah. I was literally learning to make beats by, by, by taking samples of Nine Inch Nails and Smashing Pumpkins and Rage Against the Machine and putting Mob Deep over the top oh. of it in like a break beat. I did the weirdest stuff. And we loved it. I mean, that's what, that's kind of how the band came about. So when they said, can you do this? I was like, hey, I can do this. <laughs> well, I put the thing together and, and we did it. And by the time we put it out, we were all saying to each other internally, which we didn't say to them, we're going to make this thing something they can never follow up. They won't, not only will they not be able to do another like series of this, they yeah. won't be able to do a second episode of this. The Collision Course EP achieved immense commercial success upon its release on November 30th, 2004. It became the first EP since Alice in Chains' 1994 release, Jar of Flies, to top the Billboard album charts. This marked Linkin Park's second US number one album and Jay-Z's eighth. Subsequently, 
The band took a brief hiatus, with Shinoda forming the group Fort Minor and Bennington playing in the band Dead by Sunrise. However, Bennington soon found himself in a troubled marriage and struggling with alcohol dependency. He later recounted to Rolling Stone, I drank myself to the point where I couldn't leave the house and I couldn't function. Nevertheless, the repercussions of his alcohol abuse were not limited to Bennington alone. His bandmates also felt its impact. Did you experience that with your with your band once you got out? You got to, they got to tell you things. That was the roughest. I mean, I didn't think that I was a, uh, that my behavior was affecting their them. lives. Their lives. Yeah, they're afraid of me. Mm -hmm. You know, they're afraid to tell me things. You know, like I'm a cool guy. I'm mellow, and apparently I'm easy going. Low, low maintenance. <laughs> I'm a lead singer. In a determined effort to turn his life around, Bennington bravely entered rehab, embarking on a transformative journey. He embraced sobriety, navigated a divorce, and ultimately found love again with his second wife, Talinda Bennington, in 2006. Later that year, Linkin Park re-entered the studio with a new resolution, to evolve beyond their familiar sound and create something fresh and innovative. We wanted to make something special and unique, and maybe making part three of, you know, Hybrid Theory Meteor, we kind of call those volumes one and two. Um, we weren't really into that idea. And so at that point, we, we started working on music. We met with Rick Rubin. And when, when, when we were asked, you know, from Rick, um, what kind of record do you guys want to make? And we said, well, we don't want it to sound anything like what we've done before. And he said, great, that's the only way I'll work with you guys. We knew that we had just opened the door to a very dramatic change and like a pretty complicated thing for us as a band to get through because it's way easier than it sounds. It's easier to say we want to do something different than it actually is to do it. At this stage of their careers, the band grew to dislike the new metal label that the press had assigned to them, with Shinoda telling Kerrang! in 2007. People kept wanting to label us rap rock. We thought, fine, you're pissing us off. We're going to make something so different that you can shove new metal up your Redefining their sound proved to be an immense challenge as the group toiled for 14 grueling months in the studio. The album, titled Minutes to Midnight, was preceded by the single What I've Done, a noticeable departure in style from the band's previous works. Fans were surprised by the song's political lyrics, targeting humanity's detrimental impact on the environment. Finally, on May 14, 2007, Minutes to Midnight was released, marking a new chapter for Linkin Park. Rolling Stone would praise the band's new sound, describing it as honed metallic pop with a hip-hop stride and a wake-up kick. Meanwhile, a decidedly more negative review deemed Minutes to Midnight as passé and summed the band's effort up as opting to create a muddled colorless murk. Despite the sonic shift, all five singles from the album charted on the Billboard Hot 100 and sold 5 million copies globally. While Minutes to Midnight hinted at Linkin Park's future direction, it was their subsequent album that truly brought their vision to life. Diverging even further from their original musical style, the 2010 release of A Thousand Suns showcased a forward-thinking blend of industrial and electronic elements while addressing a range of social issues and the fear of nuclear war, with nearly half of the tracks consisting of instrumental interludes. And while some embraced Linkin Park's new approach, others rejected the album upon first listen, feeling Linkin Park had strayed too far from their core sound. A Thousand Suns, for example, which was our fourth record. It was a very commercially successful record. However, it was very polarizing. Um, it got one or five stars by everybody. So we ended up with three-star ratings all over the board because it's like half the people hated it with all of their heart and soul. Despite polarized opinions on the album, A Thousand Suns ultimately secured Linkin Park their fourth platinum record. After releasing two albums brimming with political undertones, the band redirected their attention to more personal themes such as relationships and trauma on their 2012 album Living Things. The album would see Linkin Park blending components from their last four releases to forge a distinctive sound. 
The band expressed that they finally felt comfortable in their own skin, after years of musical experimentation. Living Things cemented Linkin Park's absolute dominance of the music industry, debuting at the top of the Billboard charts in June of 2012, and giving the band their fourth consecutive number one record. Nevertheless, even with everything he had accomplished up to this point, Chester Bennington had still not fulfilled his lifelong dream. But that was all about to change. On February 27th, 2013, San Diego-based alternative rock band Stone Temple Pilots parted ways with their longtime singer, Scott Weiland. Replacing him would be no easy feat. However, when STP guitarist Dean DeLeo came across footage of a Linkin Park performance which saw Bennington donning a Stone Temple Pilots shirt, he knew he had found his band's next frontman. DeLeo would subsequently reach out to Bennington in hopes of persuading him to join STP, which proved to be shockingly easy to do. As a teen, Bennington used to fantasize about singing in Stone Temple Pilots, and had later professed an interview interviews that fronting that very group was his lifelong dream. So when he was offered the gig, he immediately accepted. My instant gut reaction, which is usually the right action to do, um, especially on big things like this, um, was yes. And uh, at the same time, once I said yes, that was when I was like, oh shit. You know, I just said yes, and this is pretty heavy. Even still, others would worry if the singer's new responsibilities would distract him from his commitments to Linkin Park. Are you the lead singer of Linkin Park? Are you the lead singer of STP? Or are you the lead singer of both? The lead singer of both. Linkin Park is top priority. It's, you know, that's, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to sacrifice anything with Linkin Park to do something outside of Linkin Park. But that also doesn't mean that I'm not going to give 100% to what I'm doing with STP as sure. well. So, you know, um, I think it's possible to do both. Mike Shinoda confided in Howard Stern about Chester's tendency to overcommit to multiple projects, sometimes leaving his Linkin Park bandmates hanging. Despite the challenges, Shinoda noted that Bennington handled his dual roles fairly smoothly. After extensive tours and even a five-song EP, Bennington eventually amicably resigned from Stone Temple Pilots to refocus on Linkin Park. Scott Weiland, however, would never return to his post in Stone Temple Pilots as he was tragically found dead of an accidental overdose while touring with his solo band. Linkin Park's next album marked a return to form for the band. The band opted to self-produce, shedding their electronic rock persona to revisit their new metal origins on 2014's The Hunting Party. Mike Shinoda would describe the upcoming release as a straight-up rock record, positioning it as a bold statement against the conformist trends that were prevalent in mainstream rock at that time. One, we've been making elect, you know, electronically heavy records for a while, and so we're kind of getting a little bored of that. Um, there's nothing out right now that is heavy that makes us go, that's cool. There's something about radio right now that is not satisfying us completely. People are being tricked into believing that they're listening to a rock station when it's not a rock station by any means. It's playing pop songs and it's playing adult contemporary jams. I mean, it's like it, it, there is there is definitely a, a, a sense of safety, and um, and that's okay, but that's not for us. Yet despite the band's return to their heavier roots, The Hunting Party failed to secure the top spot on the Billboard charts upon its release in June of 2014, bringing the band's streak of number one albums to an end. The album would see an 80% drop in sales in its second week and would prove to be the band's slowest selling album to date. Work on the band's follow-up was set to begin the following year, but things would soon take a tragic turn. In August of 2016, Bennington experienced a harrowing three-day relapse, which regrettably continued with weeks of ongoing drinking. After Bennington's return from rehab, Linkin Park debuted Heavy, the lead single from their forthcoming album, One More Light, 
A sentimental dance pop duet, the song faced immediate backlash from both fans and critics alike who disapproved of the band's sudden shift to pop music. Spin Magazine found the song to be a failed attempt to stay relevant against current popular rap rock bands like 21 Pilots, writing, So, how bad is heavy? It's not as bad as you'd think. It will annoy you no more and no less than any other blowout pop duet else you're likely to hear on the radio while you're at the gym or the supermarket. It's fairly astonishing to see Linkin Park bend their knee so shamelessly for a taste of the charts. Bennington in particular struggled to gracefully handle the negative feedback, lashing out in interviews and over social media. He went as far as telling fans to harm themselves if they disliked the song and even threatened to kill those who accused him of selling out. Unfortunately, the album's remaining tracks didn't escape unscathed either. One More Light received severe criticism upon its May 2017 release, ultimately becoming a subject of ridicule throughout the music media. Oh god. This album is terrible, and I don't even know where to start explaining why. It's a complete and utter betrayal of of everything that originally made Linkin Park appealing to begin with. In favor of an album that sounds like it's just a bunch of runoff from some of the most cliched and overplayed pop and EDM anthems over the past two to four years. Despite the relentless negative press, One More Light not only dominated the album charts, but also saw a strong performance for two of its singles on the charts. In the same month as the album's release, tragedy struck as Chester Bennington's close friend friend, Soundgarden frontman Chris Cornell, was discovered lifeless in his Detroit hotel room after his band's performance the night before. Bennington, deeply affected, sang at Cornell's funeral and paid tribute to him on Twitter, where he wrote, Your voice was joy and pain, anger and forgiveness, love and heartache all wrapped up into one. I suppose that's what we all are. You helped me understand that. Amidst the emotional turmoil, fans continued to antagonize Bennington and his band for their recent shift to pop. At Hellfest in June of 2017, Linkin Park took the stage only for their new songs to receive a disheartening response, with some fans expressing disapproval through booing, middle fingers, and even hurling trash at Bennington. In spite of the hostility, the singer still put on an all-time great performance, as was stated by Linkin Park's director of touring in an interview with Rolling Stone. We saw the most alive and present Chester of my 15 and a half year history history with the band. He was arguably in the best physical condition of his life. Nevertheless, warning signs emerged for those close to Chester Bennington, hinting at a deeper struggle. The singer had recently confided in his Dead by Sunrise bandmate Ryan Shuck about his struggle to make it to six months of sobriety. Shuck, who battled his own substance abuse struggles, shared with Rolling Stone the harrowing account of Bennington's hourly struggle with addiction. The vivid details painted a chilling picture of Bennington's internal battle when the temptation for alcohol struck. Bennington would also candidly discuss his declining mental health during an interview with the Los Angeles radio station. I don't know if anybody out there can relate, but like, I have a hard time with life. Sometimes. Right. Sometimes it's great, but a lot of times for me, it's really hard. And, um, and no matter how I'm feeling, like, I always find myself like struggling with certain patterns of behavior, I find myself like stuck in like a, in like the same thing that keeps repeating over and over again. And I'm just like, how do I end up, how am I in this? I know that for me, when I'm inside myself, when I'm in my own head, it gets, a, this place right here, this, this, this skull between my ears, that is a bad neighborhood. And I am, <laughs> I should not be in there alone. When I'm in that, like I get I, my whole life gets thrown off. Like if I'm in there, like I don't say nice things to myself. Like there's another Chester in there that's like, wants to take me down. Linkin Park was set to take off on a nearly 40 date US tour in late July. However, before the tour, Bennington took a much needed vacation with his family at their cabin in Sedona, Arizona. During the trip, a home video captured him in good spirits, enjoying time with loved ones during a family game night. He returned early from vacation on July 19th, anticipating a photo shoot with Linkin Park the next morning. 
Tragically, he never made it, as Chester Bennington self-deleted that very night, discovered by his housekeeper the following day. In the room where Bennington took his last breath lay a half-empty bottle of alcohol, as well as his boarding pass from the flight he had taken the day before, serving as a poignant memento of his final moments with his beloved family. Were there warning signs that that you saw at the time or that now in retrospect stand out to you? Absolutely, absolutely there were. I am now more educated about those signs, uh, but they, they were definitely there. The hopelessness, the change of, change of behavior, isolation, that was all part of our daily life. It's sometimes some signs were there more than others, some signs they weren't there at all, um, as the case right before he passed. He was at his best before he passed. We were on a family vacation. He just had to go back home to do a television commercial, and we were, I was going to see him the next day. It was just the timing of it. You know, he had been in uh, states of depression before, and he had um, had past attempts. This was not a time where we, any of our families, suspected mm. this to happen, which is terrifying. Bennington's widow would further acknowledge that the singer had made previous attempts to self-delete during their relationship. The singer's death coincided with what would have been Chris Cornell's 53rd birthday, and speculation quickly arose that Cornell's death was the tipping point for Bennington, while others dismissed it as mere coincidence. A close friend would tell Rolling Stone, It could be a part of it, but it's a small part of it. I think that it's just another horrible event that gets put in your subconscious. Conscious. It's kindling, but the fire was already burning. We don't know how much he drank, but it doesn't take much when you're that advanced an alcoholic and an addict and you're battling to the extent he described to me. You don't need much to lose your mind for a minute. Mike Shinoda recounted to Rolling Stone the final time he saw Chester, just days before his passing. They spent the afternoon together, collaborating on music and discussing their upcoming tour. Following Bennington's tragic passing, Linkin Park shared a heartfelt open letter and tribute in honor of their beloved friend, which read, We're trying to remind ourselves that the demons who took you away from us were always part of the deal. After all, it was the way you sang about those demons that made everyone fall in love with you in the first place. I always tell people that there are the stages of grief that everyone talks about. Um and the five stages don't come in order and they don't come in an expected way you could be like in denial for five minutes anger for 30 seconds and then switch 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 and it can sneak up on you out of nowhere like you just be driving and be like i'm so angry like why am i so and you're angry at something stupid you don't even know why you're angry but you realize oh i know i'm angry later you figure it out. The band then held a tribute show for Bennington, with several special guests in Los Angeles, with Linkin Park's future after that point remaining decidedly uncertain. After Chester passed, I was afraid to leave my house. Um, I was afraid to listen to our music. I was afraid to like get uh, to even touch an instrument. Like all those things just felt uh, like tainted, you know. Um, and I was asking myself, like, is this over? Do, I, do you, you know, do I ever, do I even play music anymore? Despite his conflicting feelings, Mike Shinoda would release his solo EP titled Post Traumatic Six Months After Bennington's Death. The EP contains three songs written by Shinoda as a way to cope with the loss of his friend and to express everything he'd been going through in the weeks since. Shinoda would tell fans, Art has always been the place I go when I need to sort through the complexity and confusion of the road ahead. I don't know where this path goes, but I'm grateful I get to share it with you. Linkin Park has since firmly remained on a hiatus from performing, facing countless questions from the press regarding the band potentially playing live shows ever again. And the last one, have you thought about what a Linkin Park tour would look like in the future? Um... I don't have an answer for that, no. Okay. There's lots of like ideas, you know. I, I think I've made it pretty clear. A few people have asked if I would consider a hologram. 
Mm. And made it pretty clear that I don't like that idea. Shinoda has also been asked on whether Linkin Park will find a new singer to replace Bennington, to which he would respond, It's not my goal to look for a new singer. If it does happen, it has to happen naturally. If we find someone that is a great person and good stylistic fit, I could see trying to do some stuff with somebody. I would never want to feel like we are replacing Chester. Linkin Park continues to honor and uphold the legacy of Chester Bennington today, even unearthing songs they recorded with the late singer in years past. In August of 2020, the band announced a 20th anniversary edition re-release of their debut album, Hybrid Theory, which featured the addition of an unreleased track titled She Couldn't, which was recorded in 1999 shortly after Chester Bennington became an official member of Linkin Park. The reissue was so successful that their label pushed them to do something similar to commemorate the 20th anniversary of Meteora. Shinoda would admit he was apprehensive about the idea, not wanting to make a habit out of doing 20th anniversary projects for each album. Nevertheless, a 20th anniversary edition of Meteora was unveiled on April 7th, 2023, spearheaded by the release of a previously unheard demo track titled Lost, which exclusively featured Bennington on lead vocals. The super deluxe edition of the reissue would even contain a collection of unreleased released demos that were recorded before and during the Meteora sessions. These new songs were met with widespread celebrations by fans, who were elated to hear Bennington's beloved voice atop brand new melodies. Yet, just when fans thought they'd heard it all, Linkin Park surprised them in 2024 with a previously unheard Bennington-fronted song from the One More Light sessions titled Friendly Fire. This was followed up by the band's first greatest hits album, Paper Cuts, released on April of the same year, spanning the best-selling singles released over their illustrious and incomparable career. The future beyond that remains unknown, with speculation that Linkin Park may never tour or create new music again. Despite this uncertainty, the group stands out as one of the top-selling bands of the 21st century and among the world's highest-selling music artists, having sold over 100 million records worldwide. Even more remarkable are the countless bands inspired by Linkin Park since the release of Hybrid Theory, attributing their musical journey to the band. So regardless of what lies ahead, it's evident that Linkin Park has already solidified their legacy and left an indelible mark on the music industry that will not soon be forgotten.